he said it was a bone marrow disorder. And that was about it. I mean, he didn't really go into a lot of detail, which I couldn't understand. He just, I don't think he wanted to, since he wasn't my regular physician, he didn't want to have to tell me all the nasty stuff about it. But uh, him knowing that I was going to get on the Internet and read about it, he should have told me instead of me being at home alone reading that. So I, I was m more mad at him than having the disease. <laughs>talk about myelodysplastic dysplastic syndromes. MDS is a difficult diagnosis. It's also difficult for patients to understand what the disease is. Over the past few years, there's been an explosion of understanding about what MDS is and several new treatment options. In this program, we're going to describe different communication techniques on how to describe a complex disease like MDS to our patients. The goal of the program is to be able to communicate to the patients all the various treatment options for the patients so that they have the best possible chance of making the right treatment choice that fits their lifestyle. So hello, Pat, and welcome. Uh, I, hear that, I see that you're here for a discussion of MDS, and uh, we read through your chart, but tell me, how were you first diagnosed? Well, I went to my GP and had a pap smear done, and it was, had some air, no, air abnormalities in it. And uh, so I had a cone biopsy done by a gynecologist, and he didn't like the blood work he saw when he had the test done. So he asked for some more blood work, and whatever he saw, he sent to a hematologist, and they called me and said, you need to come in today. I and that didn't sound good when you say come in today. Yeah. And so I came in, and they said, you know, we think you have MDS, but we have to do more work. Yeah. But uh, it was a complete shock to me. How many, how many of the blood counts were low of the hemoglobin, platelet, and white count? The hemoglobin was the only one that was low at the time. Okay. And did you have any inkling that something was going on? Well, I'm a teacher, kindergarten, and I would get home from school and I would just want to crash for a couple of hours right after school, and that would happen maybe once or twice a week. So, But being a teacher, you think that's normal. Yeah. So from there, uh, they had the low blood counts. I guess your local doctor then uh, did some workup to look for vitamin, mineral deficiencies mm -hmm. or viral infections. Mm -hmm. And at, at some point, it looks like that the doctor recommended to do a bone marrow biopsy. Right. Is that right? Yes. And then what happened there? So they did the bone marrow, and did you discuss the results after that? Well, when he told me I had MDS, uh, I said, well, could you please write the word down because I will look this up on the internet as to what it is. And he said, all right, and he wrote it down and he, he said, well, you know, it's uh, a blood disorder, bone marrow disorder. And I said, all right, and he says, when I got back to the house and I, I checked the internet and it said, you know, like the survival rate, and I'm going, survival rate? Mm. So I was a little shocked at that and the uh, at the time, it did not look very promising. Right. I bet that it was scary to see. It was. I was upset with the doctor. So this case is a case of an intermediate to high-risk MDS. This patient is coming to us, had a, several years ago, a low-risk MDS diagnosed. She was treated with Procrit, developed a Del 5Q clone, a deletion of the chromosome 5Q, and was then put on Revlimid. After Revlimid, she was on that for several years and achieved a, a very good hematologic improvement. But then she started to have a worsening of her blood counts. And on repeat bone marrow biopsy, it showed that she had additional chromosome karyotype abnormalities. And so she presents to us today in the clinic to talk about her high-risk MDS, 
the excess blast that we're seeing in her bone marrow, and a discussion of what kind of treatment options she has at this point. What do you know about MDS? Oh, I know that MDS is a genetic, uh, a general term used for any kind of blood disorder. It's sort of a blanket mm -hmm. of possibilities of what it could be. Yeah. Um, that it's progressive and it can go quickly or it can just be like me, fortunately, uh, be very slow. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful for that. Right, right. Um, so, Pat, as your doctor, one of the things I promise to be is honest with you uh, and upfront. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that I noticed that you haven't said about MDS is when your readings and your discussions with the other doctor is the word cancer. Uh, ha so, has anyone talked with you about this being a cancer? No, I've been told it's not a cancer. Okay. So, uh, in actuality, uh, what we've learned is that MDS actually is a cancer. So, what a cancer is, is are when cells are growing out of control. Mm -hmm. And so, MDS is a situation where the, uh, the bone marrow cells, there's a group of bone marrow cells that are growing out of control. Mm -hmm. So, one of the issues I first noticed with this patient is that she was very surprised to learn that her MDS is a cancer. Yeah, that, that is a uh, common reaction of surprise. Uh, you know, MDS has had a history where in the, uh, the middle 1900s, it was actually called the pre-leukemia. And it was at that point in history questioned to be a cancer. What we've learned since then is that the MDS cells are a neoplastic process. They're driven by oncogenic transformations. There are gene abnormalities that drive the cells to act like cancer. And so uh, MDS is very much a cancer. Before we talk about what some of our treatment plan options are, do you have any questions about what we've talked about? No, I think, well, I'm surprised when you said that it was cancerous. I mean, that was something I had specifically asked, is this cancer? And they said, no, not yet. Yes. And that the, the time frame or the decision was on the number of blasts. Yes. That once it went past 20 blasts, then it was cancerous. Yes. So that's a new revelation for me. Pat, if I can show you what we found out. So there's some recent studies um, here in uh, the last few years that have cinched the idea that MDS is certainly a cancer. And so what we've done, what we've been able to do is we've been able to use a new technology called DNA or whole genome sequencing. Okay? This is what this does is it allows us to read every letter of the DNA inside the MDS cells and your normal bone marrow cells. Wow. We've never been able to do this before in, in a uh, low-cost, fast way. Mm -hmm. But, we, but there are now, we now have this tool to do this. When we use this DNA and, or whole genome sequencing technology, what we've found is that MDS arises from a small clone of normal blood stem cells. So this is the first, let's call this the first MDS clone. I'll put MDS1, okay? okay? And competing with it are all of these normal blood stem cells. So these, these blood stem cells are trying to make your white cells, your platelets, um, and your red blood cells. The MDS cells are also trying to make your red cells and white cells, but they're not doing a very good job. They make them, but then those cells just die off because they're funny looking, funny shaped, and they're not okay. functional. Oh, what we're finding out, Pat, is that over time, this MDS cell gives rise to daughter MDS cells. We'll call this MDS2 and MDS3. 
And these daughter MDS cells give rise to granddaughters. Okay? So what ends up happening is that these MDS cells start to crowd out the normal bone marrow. Mm -hmm. Okay? Over time, one of these granddaughters, let's just pick out this granddaughter cell right here, becomes the dominant MDS cell. And she starts to take over everybody else, okay, over time. This behavior of, first of all, having multiple, uh, so we can track the genes, we're finding out there are multiple gene abnormalities, mm -hmm. not just one, not just two, but dozens of gene abnormalities in each of these MDS cells. We can track them. And this idea of these little cancer clones that are popping out like this, this behavior is a cancer behavior. Okay. All right. So th this is, we've always suspected that MDS was the cancer. And now with this new information, it really proves that MDS absolutely is a cancer. What we're also finding is that if you take a treatment and you wipe out, let's say, all of these uh, these MDS cells, you can get one of these MDS cells to give rise to a resistant clone of MDS cells that can pop out even after treatment. And that's probably what happened in the setting of, um, of the Revlimid, or the lenalidomide. I'm going to go back to your Procrit. When you were getting Procrit, the reason why it worked, Pat, was because it was working on these cells here. Mm -hmm. Okay? It was boosting the normal cells. Quick question. Yes. If I had not taken the Revmolid, would it have been better not to take the Revmolid so I didn't get the black, oh, not the black, the dots, uh -huh. but the, uh, the cancerous ones? Uh, or short answer is no. So I made a great choice. You made choice. a great choice. Okay. You made a great choice. <laughs> I was getting concerned after looking at that chart. <laughs> That was a time when I looked to the patient to look for other cues for uh, how to fully inform them of all facets of cancer. In my practice with MDS patients, you don't just stop and say, this is a cancer, do you have any other questions? But you need to keep going and keep the discussion moving so they have a full understanding of what kind of cancer this is and not a cancer in Hollywood terms, which is what they may be thinking about. Right. Often when they hear cancer, they think of someone with breast cancer or colon cancer or even a brain tumor. Um, this idea of their blood disorder now being a cancer is really overwhelming. Absolutely. What I saw in, uh, in this particular patient, in Pat, uh, our high-risk MDS patient, I saw that after that initial surprise that, uh, that she was beginning to understand, but I could tell that she wasn't fully satiated yet right. and she had more questions. Mm -hmm. I see describing MDS as a storytelling and there are some patients where you can go into in depth because they have the educational background, uh, they have the intelligence to, to dive a little deeper. And then other patients where they don't want to know more, they've heard enough and, 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 you, and you have to take their nonverbal cues uh, whether they look down on the floor or if they make a joke, or if they keep making jokes to kind of end conversation, mm -hmm. uh, those are cues that they've heard enough. And that, not that it's, it's the end of me talking to them in an educational way, but that the encounter for that day, I may have given them a, a saturating level of information for, for which they, uh, uh, they've had enough. Uh, now, we did this encounter uh, all in one sitting. And that was a lot of information. And there are a few patients that can handle this, um, this much information. Right. But I think she could do it. I think in other patients, it, it takes several encounters. Right. Um, it, it's, it's a process, a right. continual process of education um, throughout their treatment and their disease process as, as they respond or don't respond, and to make sure you get feedback on what they understand. Uh, so, Pat, with a... Intermediate to high risk MDS, you have uh, five treatment options available to you. The first is palliative care. 
So in, in this situation, we would give you just transfusions, antibiotics. We would watch you very closely. We would keep you, of course, our comfort care as, as we do with any of these treatments, keeping you comfortable. Uh, but we would not give you any medicines that would change the course of your disease, and it would not impact your long-term survival. So that's always an option. Now, we know you, and we've had a discussion here, and we know that that's n not the choice that you probably would make. Is that correct? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. It sounds like you want to go for something that impacts the disease, that tries to get rid of it. Definitely. Okay. So the options then left to us are four options. Uh, a transplant, which would be the definitive treatment. It would be the only chance for cure for MDS. And we've talked about, about that a little in the past, and uh, that would be a very high risk for you, given that you don't have any sibling donors, that match sibling donors. Right. Induction chemotherapy in the hospital is an option, but it carries a lot of risks. And we usually reserve that kind of chemotherapy for, MDS, for very high risk MDS patients for, that are soon to develop a leukemia. The last two options are lower intensity chemotherapy, azacitidine and acitabine chemotherapy. Both have shown to be effective in intermediate and high risk MDS. Okay? They work uh, somewhat similarly. They work twofold. One is that they act as phony DNA. So the MDS cells will take up these medications think that they're DNA, try to multiply the MDS cells, but not be able to because they've oh. got this phony DNA stuck inside the MDS cells. Okay. okay, That's one way it works. The other way these drugs work is that they can open up the genes, open up the DNA on the inside of the MDS cells, and allow them to fully mature instead of being stuck in a very immature state. So those are the two ways that these drugs work. The azacitidine is given over seven, over seven days of every month. The cytobine is given over five days of every month. Right. Okay. It's given in the outpatient clinic, so you do not have to stay overnight here. Um, the, there's a survival benefit with azacitidine that's proven in a randomized clinical trial. So this is a tough topic, and, and uh, in, in some ways, if you're going to bring up survival, you also have to bring up the fact that this is a cancer. Because uh, in MDS patients where the average lifespan could be as short as uh, a few months to as long as several years, uh, regardless, there's usually a limiting lifespan. And the cause of death can be due to cytopenias related to the MDS. So, uh, talking about MDS uh, as a cancer, and which leads into what are my chances of survival. I think talking about survival is indicated in every case of MDS. Patients should know how severe this disease is, mm -hmm. and it helps them in terms of planning. So there's legal aspects mm -hmm. that are going on. There are financial aspects. And most importantly, there are family and emotional aspects to this uh, ramifications of this disease, consequences of this disease, that are all wrapped into survival. And so it's out of respect to the patient and their surroundings that we speak to survival. Now, not all patients are ready to talk about survival in the first encounter. And so I very much go off of the nonverbal cues again. So are they, do they have downcast eyes? <clears throat> are they, uh, looking away from me? Are they diverting conversation, deflecting conversation to other topics? And there have been a few instances <clears throat> where <clears throat> I've held off on the survival discussion until after I've delved into what are the defense mechanisms and what are they defending. So we've dealt with that <clears throat> and then I've come back to the survival issue and talked about you have high-risk disease, the, the, the average survival at this point of doing nothing is only about a half year or less, or uh, uh, between a half year and a year, and, and that's the onus for which we need to start treatment. And this particular patient with Pat, I thought that we could do that. She was engaged. Mm -hmm. She was asking questions. 
she was nodding in the affirmative as I was going along so I could tell that she was understanding what I was saying and she was asking appropriate questions. Right. So these are all these are all positive cues to me to keep going to give this information. And I think once I was able to give that information, I could then trust that she could then begin to understand her treatment options and then make an informed choice about what she would want to do. And the risks for both of these uh, are, in, uh, the big thing is neutropenic fever uh, with, uh, with, with both of these uh, treatments. Um, Leslie, do you want to uh, talk to Pat maybe about what to look out for with, with, with these low-grade chemotherapies? Sure. So um, your white count uh, will be low if you go on these uh, therapies. You'll have to um, pay attention if you have any fevers at home. You'll want to monitor your temperature every day. You're going to want to um, make sure when you are neutropenic that you follow a diet that you're not eating fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, I heard you mention you like to mow grass and you have <laughs> acreage and you like to be outside. There may be some lifestyle modifications that you'll need to do in um, avoiding mowing the grass when you're neutropenic. Um, let the horse eat the grass. <laughs> yeah. Yes, let the horse eat the grass. Uh, get a little goat. <laughs> Tell us about your um, caregiver situation. So do you have someone that can help you? Um, do you have family nearby? I have family nearby, but they all work. So this is a concern that I have if I had to go into the hospital for a transplant or whatever. And coming out, what my problems are going to be with having to have a caregiver, uh, that's a major concern. Uh, fortunately, right now, I'm living alone and doing all right. Great. Have you spoke to your... Um, family yet about your situation and and the progression and the need to go to the chemotherapy? That's different because my kids have seen me with this for so long, it's almost second nature. It's like, oh yeah, well, she's got to go in for another bone marrow biopsy, big whoop. You know? uh, sometimes I think they have gotten complacent with this. So I'll How do you feel about that? In some ways it's good because I don't want them to worry too much about it. But um, I don't feel like I can talk to them seriously about it, because if I say anything uh, about the lifespan, they just want to turn me off. You know, I'll, we don't need to talk about that now. So. I was mm -hmm. wondering if, if you could, uh, when you approached, when you were listening to the patient, what were your thoughts and how were you gauging this caregiver plan situation? Well. Um, like she stated, she's single, she lives alone, she does have family that is in the general vicinity on the same acreage where she lives, but they all work, they have families of their own, and it was concerning to hear that she doesn't have a dedicated person if she was to need um, continuous support. And um, it sounded like she was uh, not wanting to burden anyone by asking for help or ne just needing help from anyone in her family or friends. It was nice to hear that she had people around her and I think one of the things that we're going to have to work on with her is to is to try to uh, congeal that plan and <clears throat> so that she we know who the backup person will be if she has a fever in the middle of the night uh, right. If she develops a rash, if she needs a ride to work, if she needs to get help with groceries, if we know, if she could tell us who that is or right. who that group of people are, I, they're there. I think if we work with her and the social worker to, Absolutely. to, to pull that plan together, uh, I, I think it would help and put us in a prepared situation uh, and, and that's going to help us in the, in the future with her. Yes. Leslie, are we missing anything else? Um, no, I just wanted to make sure to remind you, if you do choose to start on the azacitidine as part of the neutropenic fever and you develop chills and you take your temperature and it's rising, always give us a call. We need to keep a line of communication open with our staff mm -hmm. so that if you do have a fever and you potentially have an infection, we can get you admitted here to the hospital right away, started on antibiotics so that we prevent the progression of the infection. Yeah, and that's a problem I have is that I minimize things. 
oh, well, you know. That, that's well, nothing. then that's really important that, to that, keep some communication. Mm -hmm. And I would advise keeping a log. If you, uh, you know, log your temperatures every day, log when you take your medicines, and try to keep, you know, track of how you feel so that, um, you know, you're engaged going through the process and that you can communicate to the team because sometimes I can't remember what happened last week. <laughs> but if you were, you know, had a couple days where you really felt bad or you were nauseated, we have things that we can help manage those symptoms. All right. That sounds good. I like the journal idea. Okay. Well, thank you for coming today. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all the information you've given me. Certainly. So in this case, we saw a patient with high-risk MDS. This patient comes to us with excess blasts, and we were able to talk with her about low-dose chemotherapy agents such as Lidaza or azacitidine and decidabine, or also called dacogen. Now, the patient had a few issues that came up during the interview. Number one, she was surprised that there was cancer and to hear the MDS described as cancer. And so we were able to describe to her that MDS is a cancer. We were also able to work off of those nonverbal cues. Now I could tell that she would respond to some visual illustrations. And so we took the time to depict on the board what the MDS looks like. And I could tell that she was interested in this and was gaining information by her nods of affirmation, if she had not given me those cues, I would have probably used another means to explain MDS as a cancer. But I find that the visual representation often works with patients in MDS. The second point in this case is the uh, informal caregiver plan that she had. With this patient, I think we'll need to formalize the caregiver plan. Mm -hmm. We'll need to work with the patient and the caregiver or in, and uh, the potential caregivers around her so that we have a uh, backup network for her for help with medications and groceries, et cetera, well before we start the chemotherapy in this patient. The third thing in this patient was the talk about survival. And so important in this was to assess that the patient was ready to talk about survival. So understanding that, the, that this is a cancer, understanding that we're concerned about the caregivers and the people around her, understanding that there are treatment options that are available, it's a setup, it's a good setup to then talk about uh, survival. And so we were able to deliver that information uh, to her uh, in a sensitive way that was respectful to the patient. 